Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Paul Johnson. We are The Last Nighters. You can find us on the Launchpad Media where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. At least I think you can find us on there, though I've heard uh, that we haven't been on there in a little while. So I'm going to go check in with them on that. But tonight we're going to be talking about Elite of Battle Angel. This is episode 136 of the show. You can find the show notes more at lastnighters.com slash 136. And tonight we're going to be having a returning guest. Uh, he was on last about two years ago. Uh, for a musical rendition of Les Miserables, and we know how Robert loves musicals. But uh, tonight he has suggested we talk about Alita Battle Angel, and he actually suggested this over a year ago, and I finally got around to watching it. And uh, after seeing it, I reached out to him and was like, hey, do you still want to come, in, come on and talk about it? And he said that he was game for it. So uh, welcome back to the show, Alex. Uh, you were a great guest last time, and I'm glad to have you back. And just so you know, uh, I am not... Um, auditioning for cats. I don't know if you can see this, but it kind of looks like uh, uh, a, a cat whisker on the one side is because I was wrestling my dog and I got a dog claw in, in the cheek, but welcome back to the show. Well, thank you, sir. You look good, I think. Uh, and I'm chipped and ready just to let you know that chip does record everything that comes through my ears. So uh, just watch, watch the language. Okay, we will definitely watch the language tonight. And uh, just so if anyone wants to check out your prior appearance, then go to lastnighter.com slash 58. That's where we talked about the musical Les Miserables starring Wolverine. Right, Robert? Wolverine was in that one? Yeah, Wolvie Berserk style. He was going crazy, killing everybody. It was wild. Yeah, and singing, and a song, and I'm singing. That's or exactly however, what that movie was like. How, how were they doing an elf? It was even better than that, though, if you can imagine. You can imagine what it would be like. <laughs> so, Alex, um, we're, we usually start off with the Google description, but before we get to that, uh, I wanted to ask you what was the thing that when you saw this movie, you were like, oh, that's one I want to do. So what, what made you want to do this one with us? So I guess first off, um, I'm a big sci-fi fan. Um, I'm not really into the super techie sci-fi. And this was more of that, um, I guess, broad spectrum where they don't get into the details. They just show a society and let your imagination kind of fill in the details. Um, so it's a potential future I could see happening based on events that are going on in our society now. And I kind of like the interpretation of the outside viewer, which is Alita. She comes into it basically blind, not knowing anything about the society. Uh, and it provided, I think, a unique observation on certain cultural things we may see going on right now. All right. Very good. Yeah. I think that I saw a lot of stuff worth talking about. And I think that in the present day, there's actually probably more now than there was a year ago when you suggested it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got some notes that might be related to that that we'll uh, get to shortly after this uh, Google description. And then I'll go to Robert for his take on it. So Lead of Battle Angel came out last year. It's a PG-13 action sci-fi movie, two hours and two minutes, currently playing on HBO Max and Hulu Premium. It uh, got a 7.3 IMDb, 61% Rod Tomatoes, 53% Metacritic, but however, 93% of Google users liked it. Its uh, description reads, set several centuries in the future, the abandoned Alita is found in the scrapyard of Iron City by Edo, a compassionate cyber doctor who takes the unconscious cyborg Alita to his clinic. When Alita awakens, she has no memory of who she is, nor does she have any recognition of the world she finds herself in. As Alita learns to navigate her new life and the treacherous streets of Iron City, Edo tries to shield her from her uh, mysterious past. Says it came out on Valentine's Day of last year, 2019. Director Robert Rodriguez, produced by uh, our man James Cameron, starring Christoph Waltz, has Jennifer Connelly, and Alita is uh, cryogenically frozenly played by Rosa Salazar. Uh, Robert, let's get your take on the uh, Google description here. Well, Alita Battle Angel, I want to say it was a bit controversial when it first came out because it was coming out right around the time when Captain Marvel came out. And Captain Marvel was bashed, I mean, mostly by fans due to Brie Larson's unique pro-feminist, pro-diversity, intersectional perspective. And the movie itself, I mean... The Brie Larson, you know, the Captain Marvel was like 
panned by, I would say, most comic book fans. I mean, there were some comic book fans still liked it, of course. Um, but I'd say most of them were like, man, we don't like this. We don't like this character. We don't like Brie Larson. And then Alita came out and they were like, well, this don't go see Captain Marvel. Go see Alita instead. Because this is actually a story that you can enjoy. Um, it doesn't, it isn't played by the, the main character isn't played by a block of wood that hates men. So I, um, I didn't see Captain Marvel, but I, I've seen this now twice. Um, you know, it's not, it's not my favorite film. It, um, it does some things right, but it does a whole lot more that was just kind of okay for me. Um, I did, I really did enjoy the emoting and the, um, the main character. She was very relatable for being a, a block, a blank slate type where you're just like kind of learning about the world with her. Um, it's a way for movie filmmakers to kind of explain away why there's so much exposition in their movies. So <laughs> that's a little bit kind of a crutch. I, I, I'm not a huge fan to go from loose or uncut gems where there was zero exposition, then to go into this yeah. movie where there's like all kinds of exposition, which you there would need to be, right? Because you have to explain the world you're in because you're in this futuristic sci-fi world. You need to have some explanation as to why it exists the way it is. But it was just a bit a bit jarring to have a whole lot of explaining going on. Not that I'm completely against it. It was just it was just jarring to go from one film where there was zero. You can't, it's, it's unfair to compare the two because one's set in New York City in modern day and then the other one's set in a far-flung future. So I understand, but it was just a, a bit a bit like kind of disappointing. Like I really enjoyed the lack of exposition in Uncut Gems, but then this one is... Anyway, I still I still enjoyed it. Um, Daniel, did you say how much money that this movie made? Uh, I did not, but I believe it was in the neighborhood of four hundred million, four fifty. But the uh, estimates were that they needed to clear about five to six hundred to actually make a profit on it. Okay, well that is disappointing because um, there's this movie definitely ends with a very much sequel bait ending, where the story is not resolved. And we introduce, you know, Edward Norton, who you would think that they're going to put in this movie, not in just this tiny little role, but maybe a tiny little role in this film. So that he has a bigger role in the next film. Um, but if it didn't make money, then, yeah, unfortunately, it's probably not going to get a sequel, even though Robert Rodriguez is an excellent budget filmmaker. Like he can really stretch a dollar. That guy knows how to make a really good looking movie for not a lot of money. So maybe he can get it done. I don't know. But. Uh, I know yeah. this movie was a passion project for him. He really enjoyed the source material. And uh, I think he made a pretty solid film. I, it's not, I don't think it's a fantastic film, but it's a solid film that I enjoyed. Yeah, so I, I was reading a little bit about it, and this has been a project for James Cameron for a long time. And then Avatar came up, and so it pushed this for about 10 years or whatever. And he was going to do three installments for Avatar, and he intended three installments for Alita. And I think you're right. This does certainly set up a future, uh, you know, a sequel or, or more. Uh, and I also felt in watching this that if you're in the know with the source material, then you'd be more informed with what's going on in, the, in this movie. Because it's almost like they put you in and then they assume you kind of already know some of the stuff, even though they have all that exposition where they're explaining so much. But like, there were so many times where I'm like, why would that happen? Why would, why would she want to be in this roller derby thing? It doesn't make any sense. Like they tried to explain it away by, well, she's trying to earn money for um, Hugo. By the way, I did not like the Hugo character at all. He seemed like AC Slater from uh, <laughs> uh, Saved by the Bell, like on his acting ability. Oh yeah, he was not the greatest actor, and then we could talk about that relationship and that romance. And I think I don't think the romance works, but I really still I still really enjoyed the main character. I thought Alita was fantastically played by whoever she was. Right? Yeah, she's actually the most believable character in this whole thing. I think. Yeah. No, and the and the best acted. I mean, I thought Christoph Waltz, who I've been, you know, used to seeing in Tarantino films, just being blown away by his acting. Mm -hmm. In this film, I'm like, well, he's just playing like a 
I don't know. There's just not a lot of meat on this character. Like he didn't, he usually plays like a really rich character with all kinds of weird quirks and stuff. And then this film is kind of, kind of like bland. I was a little bit disappointed by that, but Alita, Alita was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So Alex, uh, any response to anything that Robert brought up? I know he kind of shot his load there, but, uh, Oh, I got more. <laughs> well, I'd, ho I'd hope so. We have like an hour <laughs> left, right? So I guess a couple things. The first thing that you brought up was the comparison to, um, that film from Marvel, which I don't even think bears mentioning. I did see it. I thought it was terrible. Um, Marvel's been on this kick where they take you out of the story by putting in lines to to signal, the virtue signal. You know, they could just show a strong woman being a strong woman, but instead they have to throw a one-liner in there to make sure that you are aware that they're showing you a strong woman. And that's one thing I appreciated about Alita is that she is this badass, strong young woman, and they didn't have to justify it or prove it. And for me, I've raised um, two young women um, or in the process of, I guess. And to me, that kind of clicked a little bit that I don't want you to think I am a woman and I'm a strong woman. Just be a strong person. Be better. Um, so that to me was something where they just showed a strong character. They didn't have to hammer on the gender um, or or put in any of the virtue signaling into it. So. I did see the connection between the two movies at the time, and that's one of the things I liked about it. Um, and I think we can possibly talk about that a little more. Um, <clears throat> yeah, far, uh, I, I, go ahead. if I can interject, uh, there was actually a, um, a subtlety to their even talking about her being a girl. Like she mentioned, I think once or twice, like, oh, I'm just an insignificant girl. When she's talking about like disrupting the plans of this like, overseer guy uh what's his name um nova the, nova the yep. character yeah and but when i heard those lines i didn't take it as i'm an insignificant girl i'm an insignificant person she just referred to herself as a girl so to me that didn't pull me out of the storyline yeah now i do remember like the feminists getting their bras in a tizzy um when alita gets her new suit of armor and she and it mentally adjusts to her and her breasts get bigger i mean she doesn't even have breasts in the original cost in the original bodysuit but then she actually gets breasts and i thought it was just weird that the, that the feminists would be offended by a woman having breasts is that is that a newly offensive thing that i, I don't know I maybe was... it's just the ease in which she can reformulate her body in her mind's image Whereas they would have to go through like a full, you know, reassignment kind of situation. So they're just jealous of how simple it is. I think that's very valid. Mm. But I also appreciate any movie that gets the uh, feminist in a tizzy. Yeah. Yeah. I like watching movies that annoy them. It makes me happy. All right. So Alex, this uh, Molon Lab shirt. I'm, I'm, am I even saying that right? Sure. It's Latin. We don't know how it was spoken, just how it was written. Okay. So it, it says, come and take it. Well, there's a scene in this movie where Hugo says, guns are illegal. This is when they see uh, Zapan, the bounty hunter, mm -hmm. uh, hunter warrior guy walking through, and he's got this like Damascus blade that can cut through virtually anything because it's got nanotech. Uh, it's ERM technology. And he says, guns are illegal, punishable by death. And then anything he almost, to protect Zalid. Yeah, or anything that would um, that would challenge Zalim, I think was the line. It's almost a throwaway line. But it's like an admission that firearms are the one check on tyranny. And so that's why they didn't want to have them allowed uh, in this in this world or in this iron city. That sure. was basically a, a servant city to this floating city of Zalim. Correct. Yep. And that line to me rung out a lot. Anything to or anything that threatens Zalem. Because there's this power structure and it's not even like we currently have the false sense of the people's voice. We elected our officials. This is a much more forced society than we see today. 
but still that's very central to the power structures removing arms from from the people the servants right even though they can still have like these amazing uh blades and and other uh fighting techniques and weaponry and whatnot i mean right. firearms just tool and and similarly like when ito is telling her that he's not going to put her in that new erm suit because she has a chance to start over and it's just a shell what's good or bad is her and she can decide same thing with the firearm the firearm is just a tool and it's up to the person wielding it whether they're good or bad on whether you know the action that they're going to do is is righteous or or morally repugnant Sure. And Doc Ito, I think, realized that at one point because he started out by saying, I will never connect you to this because it's evil inherent. And then eventually he said, that's basically just a shell. You are you. And I think that was um, that was a message I related with, that the tool is not the cause of whatever the result is. Indeed, indeed. Now, let me get your take, guys, on the Alita character, because I did have one issue with her character that I, I understood the, the story behind her, and I think the story behind her makes sense. At least we have an explanation of why she's amazing. But in terms of the movie being, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's kind of a, Stranger in a Strange Land kind of a story. Like a you come into a world and then you don't understand it and then you're explained to it. So you have like a fish out of water type of story. But it's also kind of a hero's journey story. And generally in a hero's story, you have the hero not very strong, going up against evil, fighting evil, losing, then Fee, you know, training and getting better, and then ultimately triumphing in the end. In this film, Alita is just awesome the whole time. So I tend to think that she's kind of like a Mary Sue character, and that she's just good at everything she does. She's just the best. Everybody likes her. Now, it doesn't say she doesn't have to, she doesn't challenge, she doesn't have to fight against, you know, big gods, but. And she actually does lose at one point to that big hulking Zang. I forget his name, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but I thought she was a bit of a Mary Sue because she's just good at everything all the time. And it just reminds me of like Ray Skywalker, where she's just good at everything. Everybody likes her. She doesn't have to try to do anything. She's just the best. Do, do you guys see any of that in Alita or am I just uh, smoking too much hot? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and take that. I, I actually saw her as going through a bit of that hero's journey because she was at first in that like decorative shell that Ito had built for his daughter who had died or was murdered. And so she was, yes, she was skilled. And it was like um, due to her training, like she didn't have uh, memory of learning that stuff, but she still had like the, I don't know, muscle memory of it. Like the training was such that she still had those skills and abilities but she was sort of discovering that she had them. Uh, and we kind of see that when she's doing the the, the pickup street uh, roller derby game. And then when she first starts fighting, she's like learning or discovering that she has these abilities. And then they sort of get more and more honed. But then she does lose against Gruis Gruiska. Is that how you say it? And um, you know, it, it looks like she's she's going to die or, or not going to you know be able to carry on. But of course, you know, it's a movie and she's the title character. So uh, and and pr a prior scene, she just pulled out this Erm technology suit. So, of course, she's going to get into that. But that is like her kind of developing on that hero's journey of finally bringing uh, a little bit more of her past along with her skills and then the. Um, completing her in the type of body that she ends up in, in like a more of a warrior's type body. So I, I found that actually not too much like Ray Skywalker, which by the way, I just watched a couple of weeks ago, the last Star Wars movie. Terrible. So bad. You so loved bad. it. You loved it. 
You loved it so much. It's your favorite. You heard it. See? Oh, Rebel Scum. Yeah. All right. So, Alex, did you have any issues with uh, any Mary Sue likenesses related so, to Alita? I think she had a an ingrained power in her that she didn't have to learn. I guess when I look at what I think her struggle was, it was all internal within herself. It's trying to figure out who she was. Um, she had this inherent skill set that she was trying to learn. And we talked earlier about, you know, why would she want to play motorball? And I think they addressed that. Um, <clears throat> that adrenaline brought out her deep hidden memories. And it was a way for her to access who she was on the inside. Um, a part of her that she wasn't readily able to access. Um, so I think there was a personal journey that was more internal versus physical. That Oh, I okay. So that was the thing where Ido yeah. you know, said to her that she's drawn to conflict or whatever, and then she wanted that conflict because she was sparking memories. Okay, so it wasn't just, oh, I'm going to earn enough money so Hugo can go to Zalem. Which I think that's what drew her to it. And then she realized that she was very good at it. The same thing that drove her to become a hunter warrior. Um, and she said that line in the bar before she fought with Grishka that, you know, whose rules do I play by? Kind of saying, screw everybody else. I'm going to do what I think is right. My favorite scene in the whole film, that bar fight, the whole the bar fight. It was fantastic. That was one of my favorites. But I think my absolute favorite line was right after she fought Grishka when she flipped up and stuck her arm in his eye. Oh, fuck and your mercy. Fuck your mercy. That to me was the most powerful line in the movie. Yeah. So you guys both really liked that scene with the bar fight, but it ends with that little dog getting killed. I mean, and that's like the thing you can't do that. That's guaranteed. It was, it was off screen though. You didn't see it. I noticed that. Why would they show all these people die, but not a dog die? It's kind of a interesting look into Hollywood's take on human life versus other life. Yeah. Yeah. No dogs always seem to survive or they die off screen. It's, it's weird. People just don't, they just can't deal with a dog dying. Yeah. Did you think it was like uh, too cute that that led to the guy who had the mechanical robo hounds, like helping fight Gruishka? And that was his justification. Like, Oh, you know, he, wasn't a dog lover, so I'm going to sick my hellhounds on him. I, I think it was a good, it. good way to keep the, the plot line moving. But, okay. Yeah, this is, this is probably a kind of condensing quite a bit of material, right? I mean, I'm not familiar yeah. with the source material, but I, I know those mangas, they get really, really long. Yeah. Alex, are you familiar with, like, prior to the movie, like the background and some of the source material? I did look up some of the comics. I'm not really a comic book or manga reader. Um, big fan of the film. Uh, I looked into a couple of them. I read part of one. Uh, it just doesn't catch my catch my attention that much. So okay, yeah, I wasn't familiar with with Alita as a property. If it, I hate that term, but you get the idea, right? The, the concept. Um, but it really felt like this movie was getting you to the point where. Alita was a recognizable character of who she is uh, in the, you know, in the general uh, popular culture sense. Like if someone was familiar with Alita at all prior to this movie, this movie would be showing you how she got to the point that people are familiar with, like the rollerball derby player, which I, I, I don't even know, but I assume that's what the manga is kind of based on. And then there's this, power struggle between Zalem and Iron City. There's this techno plutocratic technocratic uh, guy running things and she's got to like rise up and fight against him. That would be, you know, movie two and movie three potentially. So Daniel, you're an anarchist and you hate property. Is that, am I getting that right? Is that intellectual property? Intellectual property is that you think property is some kind of theft of some kind, Daniel? Just the intellectual sort, the, the non uh, tangible. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, this also, this movie also made me think about those conversations we've had about sentience and self ownership, Robert, in the past. We talked about um, Ex Machina and our TNG episodes. 
Yeah, and then there was also the um, Her, I want to say. And then there was another one that we did not too long ago, well, like two years ago now. And a lot of the questions were, at what point does something have self-ownership to where you would be violating its rights by doing something that it didn't want you to do? And the question we had a couple of years ago was, can you rape a robot? And if if it's just like an object, then no, it's not possible. Like you do whatever you want with it, it's your property. But once it has a certain crossed a certain point where it's become self-aware or self-owning, then it would be possible to violate it in that way or other ways. Well, if it recognizes it's its own self as property, like I own my body, I don't care. If, if something comes up to me and tells me that it owns itself and it owns its own body, then I'm just not going to aggress against it. I don't care if it's a, a machine or a flesh and blood machine or made out of plastic. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't really matter to me. See, it's, it's, it's establishing its sentience and claiming self-ownership. And that's, and it's generally, and as long as it's not violating other people's property rights, of course. I agree. I think once you establish or are able to communicate your own self sense of sentience, then you have property rights. And that scene in Alito where she charges into the station and she takes down all the robots. Uh, what are the big robots called? Um, yeah, the big things behind Daniel the, right now. The, the big things behind Daniel right now. <laughs> Yeah, these things. I forget what they're called, too. Did, they're, they're did she like, aggress they're against Robocop. them? They're big Robocops. Right. C so Centurions? Did, Centurion, yeah, that's it. So did she aggress against them, or did she come in to address an issue, and they were overly aggressive to her? You know, Do they have rights, or did she aggress upon them? I don't think so, but I think it's something maybe worth addressing. Yeah, they didn't seem to have sentience, so they, they did seem to be purpose-built, not self-owning, free-thinking. Uh, and then they, they bring up this question of, like, can an android or a cyborg fall in love with a human, and can a human love a cyborg? So they kind of addressed it in, in, in that realm. But then I realized that Alita actually has a human brain, doesn't she? Correct. So, and some kind of, I don't know about the heart, but it looks like a, a robot heart of some kind. But yeah, there was, like, was blood the, involved, the right? The micro nanotech microaggression technology that could power the whole city yeah but it had blood pumping out of her chest right and she was eating to nourish her brain right yeah so i guess it sort of blurs the line a little bit from our prior discussions because she does have a human brain and that would i guess make it even closer to being a human and having the self-ownership like she just has all this apparatus to function or to uh, keep that brain alive and then be able to, you know, control her free will, her emotions and whatever she chooses to do. Yeah. There's no robots in this film. It didn't seem that were complete robots except for the centurions, even the, um, the mercenary guy with the sword and the pretty face. He seemed to, at least to have a human brain. It seemed he did. Yeah. He acted like he did. Because the other thing they kind of brought up was the um, Hugo and his crew, like scrapping people for parts or, you know, kidnapping people and taking their parts. Uh, right. And if, if they're cyborgs with human brains, then it's like, OK, you are stealing from sentient beings. Whereas if they were just like the Centurions, then you're stealing somebody else's property by taking those things apart. But it's kind of this weird in between because they're taking it's not like taking your arm because these are mechanical parts they're taking that are, can be replaced so it's it's like it's still wrong but it's a little bit different in nature like it's a replaceable part so they are stealing from a sentient being but it's a replaceable part versus an actual like organic part of you like uh like those organ stealers <laughs> organ thieves so where you wake up in a tub full of ice and then yeah, you got the, your liver's the gone scar or on your kidney. Yeah. So Daniel, are you putting this at a lower level of theft than actually if they'd come up, <coughs> cut off my arm and then tourniqueted my arm and then is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would think one is worse than, than another. Like if you already have a robotic arm and they take your robotic arm and 
yeah, it's a hassle and it's going to be costly, but you can get another ro robotic arm. That's less than you can't get another organic arm. At least not with today's right. technology. Or the technology as exhibited in the film. Yeah. Right. I would tend to agree. I mean, it's all immoral, but yeah, I would say one is probably worse than another, even if there are probably fetishists in this film who want complete robot bodies because, you know, turns them on or whatever. So they might value a robot arm higher than a flesh and blood arm. Right. And what did you think of, um, who was the guy? Nova. No, not Nova. Um, the guy running the the motorball. Yeah. Vector. 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 Yeah. What did you guys think of Vector and his killing of Sharin, but keeping her brain and her eyes and her hands, like I, I guess, alive, and so that he can send those up to Zalem to fulfill his promise. Notice how his promise was interpreted differently by the person he was promising the thing to versus what he intended. And so that's like an interesting concept, right? Because they both thought they were agreeing on the same thing. Like, oh, I do this thing for you and you'll send me to Zalem. But in his mind, he's like, no, you do this thing for me. And then I'll cut you into little pieces and send you to Zalem and thus fulfill my interpretation of what I'm agreeing to, but not what I know you think you're agreeing to. So. That's a very fraudulent situation from, oh, yeah. uh, my, from our buddy there. It's, it, it's needful things or that cursed uh, store in um, Family Guy where Satan runs a store. Or no, it's in uh, uh, Rick and Morty. So, yeah, you go in there, you buy a thing, and it says, oh, it'll make you younger, but it turns you into a baby or whatever. You know, it's it's cursed. It's 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 not giving you the full information of the contract. Right. And, and so whatever the understanding, whatever the normal understanding would be like, they obviously he knows that they obviously mean, no, I want to go as a whole person up to Zalem after, you know, so I go and live there, live out the rest of my days in this like beautiful paradise or whatever it is. But we don't actually learn enough about Zalem, I think, to uh know what the draw is you know and and even um grass Vector, is greener situation what's that it's just a grass is greener situation you, they, it doesn't seem like they know they just have like stories and whatnot because anybody who's been there hasn't or there's a, there are a few people that were born there right like yeah, Dr. Ito you know. and, and Sharin were there mm -hmm. Sharin definitely wants to get back Ito doesn't seem to care but everyone else who doesn't have any awareness of it it, it does seem like they would really have no way of knowing how great it is. And I liked Vector's line of, well, you can live down here like a king or just be at the bottom of the, you know, at the pond up there. What right. about you, Alex? Would I you think... rather would you rather rule in hell or just hang out in heaven? Well, I can't say because I haven't been to either, nor do I necessarily think they exist. But uh, um, on that conversation of Vector, I think him and Dr. Sharin are excellent partners or they show different parts of what society is so vector like you said he's promising x and he's interpreted as promising y and to me he completely embodies a current politician that's occupying power um, i mean if you look at the relief bills we've seen this year they say this is what it's going to do but that's just a little bit and 90 percent of it goes to you know their personal interests where Dr. Shrin, she is actually more like an up-and-coming politician, I think, within society. She's willing to do anything that she needs to do to get the outcome that she wants. And that includes going along with the plans of Vector, or who he serves, um, as the actual person in power. So I, I really like the dynamic that they displayed in the film. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I was a little confused. There was a scene um, where we first kind of see them uh, together in, I guess it's her penthouse, because that's where Gruishka ends up. She's like scantily clad, laying in the bed. So are, are, are we led to believe that they're an item or that there's yeah, more? Yeah, her Vector are having some fun. Okay. Yeah. I think I think Vector's having fun and she's going along with whatever she needs to go along with. So she's doing whatever. She's the she's, young Hillary Clinton. 
Yeah, okay. And and she's like highly skilled and was married to Ito. Ito is also very highly skilled, but he has a bit more principle because of the situation that happened with his daughter where he was doing the roller derbies and helping, um, what, what do they call it? Uh, whatever, like he was modifying people and making them have different abilities and different strengths. And he created one guy who was like this super strong, like crackhead who wanted to lift up a bus and steal some, uh, steal some more drugs. And so he just broke in and, and ended up killing uh, Ito's daughter. And that's where Ito decided, well, I'm not doing that anymore. I, I'm going to, due to that situation and the horrible outcome of that, I'm no longer going to participate in this. And so I think that's like a respectful, respectable thing that he would, um, you know, change how he's going to proceed going forward as a result of that tragedy. But also he, he uh, said that he felt like he needed to go out and get revenge. And even though he did go and get the revenge by becoming a hunter warrior and hunting that guy down, he did not find peace uh, after doing that act. And I thought that was an interesting thing because like, that is sort of a sense of justice, right? Like they did me wrong. And so eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that kind of a thing. Hatfield and McCoy style a little bit, like you're going to kill one of ours. I'll kill one of yours, that kind of a thing. But he, he realized that that did not satisfy him because it, it wasn't going to bring his daughter back, which was that ties right back in nicely with Sharin saying, Hey, you were supposed to have gotten rid of that body that you made for our daughter, this cyborg body, but he ended up using it for Alita. And in fact, that's where he got the name for her because that was his daughter's name. Yeah, that's a little bit, I don't know if you want to call it creepy, but it definitely means that he hasn't moved on from his daughter's death if he's naming new people after his daughter. I don't know. Maybe it's an honorific, maybe. I don't know. I, I, I see it as a little bit more on the creepy side. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think it is a little bit creepy and he's definitely not over it. Uh, and I think that reinforces the idea that he thought that by killing the guy who killed his daughter, that he, that would somehow bookend it or resolve it. And it didn't. So he was still dealing with that when he comes upon Alita. So, and on that, because we could talk about whether or not <clears throat> going after someone that harmed you in that fashion is right or wrong. But after he didn't feel resolved from his actions, he basically became a cop. And I don't think they addressed, you know, is that aspect of his character good or bad? Would we say that's good or bad? Because he essentially is enforcing the will of the powers above in Zalem. Or the factory, right? And mm -hmm. I, I I wasn't sure, like, is the factory like Zalem or is the factory something that's supporting Zalem? Like the, the hierarchy of the power structure, I'm not quite sure how it's supposed to function uh, related to this movie. But I did find it interesting, and this is one of the reasons why this movie is different now than a year ago, is that after the fall, or the uh, Civil War with, with Mars, uh, where all the other sky cities were destroyed except for Zalem, they no longer had police. So they effectively defunded the police and then had this uh, pseudo-private, like people could sign up to become uh, bounty hunters, basically, and that was their security system or service. But it's all also like a little bit Pinkerton style. Like it's kind of like the factory seems to be at one of the elites. And so they're the ones supplying the credits for these people who they're uh, putting bounties out on. And they can kind of control who has a bounty and who doesn't. Because like Gruishka, who of course is going around murdering women and and... I don't understand why they're doing that. Uh, and it, it's like a significant point in the movie, but I, I, I never understood why there's this serial killing of, of women going on as it relates to the film. I mean, I know what happens in real life, but um, what the fuck was I talking about? <laughs> the, the Pinkertons and how this is like a crony. It's not a, yeah. it's not a free market, like bounty hunting system. It's not no, like... I the factory is putting out their bounties and this is their procedure for determining who has a bounty on them or not. Then there's a competing organization and then another competing organization. And we're all kind of coming and arriving at the best system 
It's more of a crony <laughs> system where Zalem hands down this power to the factory. The factory puts out its bounties on who, why, we don't know. I mean, and how obviously how it's corrupt and that they don't have it on Bruishka or whatever his name is. So yeah, it's um it's not an ideal like ANCAP system that we would like advocate for. But it is interesting that it's a replacement for the cops and how they feel like it's dirty work. I see the the factory is sort of analogous to the Federal Reserve, not necessarily in financial terms, but they're an outside entity that the federal government puts in place to do their bidding. And instead of having a licensed police force, they're basically just contracting out to private citizens, but they're still accomplishing what they want to accomplish. So it's the like the way. privatized in the sense of privatizing the prisons. Like it's just a crony deal. Cor correct. Privatized prisons are not actually privatized prisons. They're incentivized versions of the state controlling people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. And then um, they did have, I guess, a they had factory law, which is what they were all saying, like, this is a violation of factory law and breaks the, the honor hunter code. killer code, the hunter killer code. Yeah. Hunter yeah. Warrior code, hunter yeah. warrior, hunter warrior code, even though it didn't seem like anybody was ever trained at the beginning. Like he went, she did. She, Alita just goes, gets her card and then walks out and she's like, oh, I guess I'm a hunter warrior now. It doesn't like explain. There's no handbook. She doesn't, she doesn't have to do any training or anything. She just walks in and walks out. What's that? Right. I thought that was funny when Zapan called her out on that. Like, oh, you, you filled out an application, you got your little card, and now you're one of us. And he has a good point. But you know, he was giving yeah. her giving her shit. But yeah, she hadn't like proven herself or you know, like um fraternities or, or uh, sports teams, like the new guy, the rookies or whatever, they'll get kind of pissed hazed taken out of them. Yeah, hazed a little I, I can can you do that anymore? Um but well, yeah, so hopefully not kill people, but yeah, they still do it. Yeah, they'll get hazed or treated badly until they uh, overcome whatever that initiation is, and then they're then they're finally accepted as one of the team members or one of the tribe. So she she clearly wasn't at that point yet, but then she was trying to force the issue by saying that she would fight anyone there uh, to have all of them help her fight Gruishka. Now that was kind of weird. Like, okay, so she's. She says, I'll fight any of you, but then that's going to bind all of you. Yeah, that's to a this... bullshit contract, man. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, is everybody going to agree to this? Or just this one guy who's going to fight and then everybody else is going to have to get roped in? This is horse shit. She, right. she was trying to flex and she was trying to unify people to fight against a common enemy. It's just no one right. else identified that common en enemy. Right, because right, he didn't have to convince them. them. Yeah. They were operating under different assumptions. Uh, they've been operators or um, agents of the factory or the state, if you will, for however long, and she was new to the game. So that's kind of that outside perspective. She's just coming in and observing the world as it exists, and they're all pretty jaded. Uh, I wonder so, how was... many people, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wonder how no, many but... people have gone in to get their Hunter Warrior license card, gone out, and then just gotten instantly murdered or murdered some old lady or murdered the wrong person. And it's just, it just seems like an unworkable system. I think but if anyway. you survey everyone that has a license to marry through some bullshit religion right now, that's probably all the people that would be a licensed hunter warrior. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. I, I thought it interesting that uh, when Ito said, you know, why he was doing it. She asked if she's doing it for the money. He's like, no, I take the money because I need the money to operate the clinic because I guess times are tough there or whatever. There's not a whole lot of prosperity. Um, but, you know, he, so he'll, he'll do it not for the money, but he'll take the money as part of it. But he does it for other reasons. And that's, I guess, trying to stamp out evil because there's other evil dudes out there similar to the guy who killed his daughter. So it's kind of nice that he had like noble intentions or noble reasons for these things. 
but it didn't seem like most of the other characters in that bar really shared those same sentiments. Like they were just kind of out for the bounties, it seemed. I think they put, yeah, they posed him as the one good apple in the bunch, right? He's the good cop. Everyone else is corrupt and evil and bad intentioned. Yeah. So basically him and Alita yeah. were the only ones they posed as good, good cops, so to speak. Although I don't I see how I don't see how Alito Ito would last one minute. I guess yeah. even with that rocket scythe or whatever it is he had, uh, one second against those super killer robot guys. I mean those those guys were quick and powerful, and he's like this normal old man. I don't care if you got a rocket scythe or not, you are going down in like two seconds. Yeah, I bought him as the cyborg doctor far more than as a hunter warrior. And I, I get there, you know, it's supposed to be this contrast, right? Like he's like this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of character in that regard. But yeah, he was totally unbelievable as a threat to any of these people with bounties on their heads. Yeah, because these are like super athlete people. I mean, imagine some doddering old 60-year-old man going up against LeBron James I mean, it would just be hilarious. I don't, I don't care if you got some weapon or not. I, and I don't know, Alita proved it multiple times when she easily took the super scythe sword away from that one guy, like just like taking candy from a baby. I mean, she was just treating him like a, a small child. I mean, she was just, her skill level was so far beyond his. Well, she's got the Panzer Kunst, which is an, a lost art. It's true. I know. I, I know. I also like I like the idea of technology and the ability to do th certain things in the past has been lost because of war and because of uh, not nurturing those things and and having this sort of dystopian future because it reminded me of like okay we're in a lockdown now like earlier we we're talking about defunding the police was a thing that was kind of exhibited in this movie well now we're looking at stunting of prosperity and the loss of the ability and the structure of production to actually create certain goods and services and no longer progress, but in fact, regress and lose ability to create certain things. And I, I thought that, that was kind of an interesting thing to see because when um, he was talking about the ERM technology, like, hey, if you damage this body, I, I can't, I can't help you. This technology is 300 years old and we have not as of yet reacquired the ability to work with this stuff. Yeah, it was a real 2001 monkeys screaming at the obelisk kind of situation. They just have no idea what it is, what it's capable of, how to how to interface with it, how to work with it. I think it's fun, absolutely. Um, and the world that they build in this film is a lot of fun. I really do enjoy it. And I would be interested in a sequel or maybe some prequels or something. I mean, I really kind of want to dive in and they talk about why they needed to destroy Zalem, the United Mars Republics or whatever, E R M ERM. U R M the ERM. ERM, yeah, yeah. But why we don't get that? Why we don't mm. understand any of that? We don't get any of that story. That would have been interesting to find out. I mean, I'm not saying to cram it into this movie. There's enough in this movie. We don't need more. But I just want to. It's an interesting world that they've made, and I, I am interested to find out more about it. I'm interested as well in <clears throat> you just kind of assume that the the erm from Mars are the protagonists because they paint um, Zalem as the antagonist, obviously, and they must have been here fighting for the right reasons. But I'm curious as to what the cause of the initial threat between the two, you know, was one threatening the other? What? How did that dynamic work out? Right, because um, we're we're on Earth, right, in correct. this movie. Yep. So it would have been Mars coming here. Correct. So yeah. I, I'm curious as to what the background is on that. That's kind of why I started to look into the comics and lost interest pretty quick. Um, <laughs> the other thing that about that dynamic, kind of an extension of that, um, is the friend uh, calls out something about, I don't get the hard body thing. And the girl says, well, it was 300 years ago. Get over it. And it just points to a mentality of they used to be our enemy, so they're still our enemy, whether or not I know why we were fighting. And, yeah. and I think there's a lot, even just in United States history, where this thing is evil because it used to be our en enemy. 
you know, if you look at things like the Confederacy or things like that, people don't actually know facts behind it. It's just this thing bad no matter what. Yeah, that's another thing that's different now in watching this movie than even a year ago when this came out, because it's almost a throwaway line in, in the movie. It's like, oh, 300 years ago. And it does seem to have sort of a progressive bent, like those characters especially. But, you know, it's 300 years ago. Get over it. Well, now I'm looking at that like, wasn't well, that an argument against being upset about slavery that was, you know, done by ancestors long ago, generations ago? Or even not slavery, just, you know, and this, you could talk for hours on that, but the idea of separating from the United States being tied into, it was only representation of slavery. I mean, that's all people think about when they think about the separatists from the United States. It's not, nobody talks about the real issues that were being discussed at the time. It's just slavery bad, Confederacy bad. Indeed. Indeed. What are, what are some more of your notes on this movie, Daniel? Well, let's see. Um, she is the uh, finest weapon of Erm of the Erm Technarchy, is what they called it. Uh, so I guess the Erm were more scientifically minded, and they let that kind of run their society. We're sort of like piecing this together from just little tidbits and comments in this. Uh, and I could liken that to today's environment, where we're supposed to be listening to the experts regarding uh, the virus and whatnot, though it seems like the experts don't always agree with each other or they blatantly ignore uh, things that don't agree with them and the politicians pick and choose which one that they're going to follow or they just allude to it and don't provide any uh, source for their proclamations, um, even though they say that they're going to follow the science, which doesn't seem like they're doing. Um, oh, there was the other line with Hugo where... Hugo wants to get to Zalem, and he shares that as his dream with Alita. And she's, like, willing to give him her heart, her microaggression heart that's worth, like, millions of dollars to get him up to Zalem. And he says to her, don't just do things for people, no matter how good you think they are. And I was trying to, like, mull that over in my head. Like, what do they mean by that in the movie, in the context of the movie? Because when I was watching it, I was like, don't enable people, you know, don't, don't make somebody who's making bad choices, make it easier for them to continue making their bad choices. But I'm pretty sure that's not how they intended it in this movie. In, unless he had sort of this guilt for knowing that because he's, he kidnaps cyborgs and takes their body parts and sells them, that's where he got 90% of the money because he's only 10%, you know, needing 10% more to get his uh, his goal, maybe that was like a, a self guilt thing, so that's why he was not willing to take the heart from her, and he had to like throw in the don't just do things for people because you don't know the full story. You don't know that I've been doing evil shit. So even though you're willing to help me, I'm not a good person, even though you don't know it. But I'm like hiding that from you because I like want to have a relationship with you. Is it, did, oh yeah, did you guys saw this. He saw this perfect act of kindness and generosity, and he was like, "What the fuck? What? what, what you, you didn't even know what you're doing. What? What? No, right? I'm a piece of I'm shit not, over I'm not, here. I'm a piece of shit. What? What the hell? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's but trying to know that the streets, about. and he's dealing with you know innocence, and he doesn't know how to interact with innocence. I, I don't think. Right, right. He's very much a street hardened character, even though I thought his acting was pretty atrocious. But yeah. Yep. Yeah, so there are some other actors that were, um, you know, in the running for this. And they said, this is in the Wikipedia, they went with this guy because he's ethnically ambiguous. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me sad. I don't, even, I don't even know what that means. I think it's because you can look at him. You look at that Seinfeld episode where Elaine's like d dating the guy and he, she thinks he's black. And right. he thinks she's he thinks like she's Spanish. Like, yeah, exactly. So they just wanted somebody who wasn't like blatantly like a particular whatever. Right, like we're, you know? we're an interracial couple, right? What? Wait, why would, we're both why white would you people? even write something like that down? <laughs> this is why we chose him. Just keep that to yourself. Yeah, wouldn't be so insulted if you're that guy. You're like, well, 
I got chosen for my skin color and my big what appearance. What is on your great. resume? Let's see. Ethnically ambiguous. <laughs> well, that was the thing. Like, winner, before winner. reading that, I was just like, oh, he's just some a white version of AC Slater. Like, I didn't see him as ethnically ambiguous at all. I just saw him as, like, doe-faced bad actor guy. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. Now, um, did you see... What did you guys think about the rollerball in this film? Um, it seemed to me to be some kind of a commentary on sports and how they can be very dangerous and how people can die in them. Like in this film, murder is illegal. And AC Slater is like, gets a thing on him because he supposedly killed a guy, even though it was the other guy. But at the same time that's happening, Alita is like killing people in the roller derby game. And of course they're aggressing against her, but Hey, it's a game. I mean, everybody's agreed to the rules, right? Apparently if there are rules, I don't know, it's not explicitly said, but she's like killing them multiple, multiple times, multiple. It's not really clear. Some of them are surviving, like heads are popping off and we've seen that heads survive, but still other times she's actually like one goes in like a, a chipper shredder. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that's outside of the thing, but I don't know if the camera's still following it or whatever, but, like, people are, like, cheering it on. And I don't know if that's, like, some sort of a commentary on bloodlust. Well, gladiatorial people, combat, gladiatorial games. Yeah, that's what I thought is gladiatorial games. Um, you know, people of our ilk like to talk about the bread and circuses. It's a big distraction, but they also use it as a motivator. You know, this is why we want to attract the best. Where in modern day society, we pay people extraordinary amounts of money to play basketball or football, whatever. In this society, it's, well, you can go up to Zalem. So they attract the most physically fit or technologically fit people. And it basically distracts all the masses. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's what our friends like to call bread and circuses. Yeah, it reminds me exactly of Gladiator from Russell Crowe's world where he's like this one gladiator. And if you win enough matches, eventually you will be freed as a slave and you can go out and live whatever your life. But there's this ultimate goal of freedom at the end of all this blood and gore. If you just kill enough people. Right. Yeah. I thought that was kind of um, not necessarily believable. Like, so the whole, you know, people getting to Zalem through, uh, what's the guy's name again vector uh was working out a deal with him where they like pay him a million credits or they do whatever he's requested and then he's going to send them the zone but of course he's going to do it in his own way and not the way that they intend but ito says well you can't just buy your way into zone but apparently you can win your way in by winning this roller derby thing like every couple of years i don't necessarily think that's like very believable that if you can't buy your way and then why would, and everyone thinks you can, then why would you believe that the roller derby guy winner is going to win? And why the would thing, the, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, the only thing I thought of was um, in Roman times, the actual fighters were uh, basically prostituted out to the wealthy women. And that's the only thing I thought of that, you know, these big cyborg guys would go up and become, almost like a toy for the for the wealthy for the elite okay that's an interesting point i was gonna say something completely opposite and wrong compared to that so thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> i'd be like why are these gladiators going up to the zalem why would they give a shit about these people but that makes sense yeah okay all right well uh we are getting close to uh needing to wind down this uh this show here so uh robert do you have any final notes that you want to discuss before we get into the final summary and review? Well, I thought for the most part the world building was good. I thought it looked better at night than I did during the day. Um, I know Robert Rodriguez, there were a few shots that bugged me and they looked like they were straight out of like the Star Wars prequels where they'd, they'd have some characters standing in front of a green screen and there's some CGI in the background and then two actors would come up and say some dialogue and then they'd leave and then it'd cut and they'd just, it just, it looked really bad. But for the most part, the movie looks good. I'll say that. Um, I don't know how much this movie was made for. I think I think you must have said it at one point. Uh, 170 million. 170 million. 
So they spent a fair amount of cash on this. I don't know how much went to the actors and how much went to the CGI, but I, I, I think the CGI looks good right now, but I worry that in 20 years, it's going to look pretty terrible. That's just the, the nature of the beast when you're relying heavily on CGI. But, you know, you're not making a movie for a nice stage, you know, an audience 20 years in the future. So get your money, make it, and get out. Well, all right. Uh, Alex, do you have any final notes that you wanted to discuss before we start to wind down here? No, I guess to me, um, it's kind of a, I hate to say it this way, but kind of a cheap sci-fi movie. It's entertaining. It's easy to watch. Um, it's less complex than The Matrix, which to me is a lowly complicated sci-fi movie. Uh, visually, I agree. I think it it was, uh, they did some things that had not been done in, in cinema before, which I would expect from James Cameron. Um, I think it was, it's entertaining and fun. Yeah, yeah. I think that this was um, trying to blend a, a live action or live action characters with a CGI type character, sort of like uh, Roger Rabbit or Gollum in Lord of the Rings. But this is like for the entire movie. Now, I would be remiss if we didn't mention the Matt Damon film Elysium where there's the character that just wants to get to the sky city or whatever to Elysium. Um, I, I don't know if that's a better film, but it, it seems like there are multiple movies where this is kind of a theme, like the grass is kind of a greener. You got these elites living in this sky city above and you're just this junky scrubby guy down at the bottom. Uh, it seems to like really argue for there being like a class system in the world and how these elites are um, immoral. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, in a, in a market based society, you only gain wealth and power through providing value. Um, if you're getting it through cronyism and the polit corrupt political system, which all creates power based on violence, then of course that's immoral. But I don't remember, we don't, we don't get the, the full story about why these sky cities are the way they are and if they actually are like oppressing the people down below, right? We don't know exactly how that relationship works. We know that Iron City feeds um, the sky city by Zalem by these pipes. We don't exactly know the relationship there. I mean... Does does the city send stuff back down? Uh, could could the, could the factory just stop making stuff and then starve the Sky City? We don't know. It seems like that would be one way to deal with some unruly Sky people. Just cut them off at the source, and then you don't have to worry about them anymore. They're not so elite; they'd have to come back down to the scrubby people that actually produce anything. I don't know. I think that was kind of also, the, I think in the, in the case of Elysium, I think they had like the super life extension technology and the main character was going to die and he wanted to go to the Sky City because they had this life technology that they didn't want to share because they were greedy, greedy technology grubbers. But I don't know. We don't get that much information in this film. We might get it in the sequel if it ever happens. Yeah, if anything, I think they had the Centurions as like the uh, keeping the the city like functioning and, and providing the goods and services up to Zalem. Well, they seem to be policing and they probably would if there were mass protests or whatever, but it didn't seem like the centurions were really capable of the nuance required. If a bunch of people just didn't want to go to work anymore. You know what I mean? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start referring to politician as Politicians is unruly sky people <laughs> from what you said, Robert. <laughs> you know, and, and with the lockdowns and everything, um, you see a lot of these tone deaf celebrities saying, oh, you know, just like stay in. It's no big deal. And they're like lounging in their pool or on their like five acres and their 3,000, 4,000 square foot like little mansion or whatever. Um, so that reminds me of like the sky people how you were discussing, you know, and then the rabble down below is the rest of us, like in small houses or apartments or being stuck and not being able to go anywhere. And like the lockdown is like costing you your job or your ability to provide for your family or 
you know, you lose everything that you've put into your business or whatever. Um, and then they're just tone deaf about it because they've got ample opulence available to them in their elite sure. position. Absolutely. No, you get a little bit out of touch. Are you trying to say that people in Hollywood are out of touch, Anya? The elites maybe are a little bit out of touch? Is that what you're trying to say? They might be. They might be just a little bit. Um, all right, so I have one more note that's uh, related to how you would see this movie differently today than a year ago, and that is when the little gang is kidnapping uh, Kanuba, I think his name was, the guy with the grappling hook, the, the, um, the guy who had won the match the night before, and they take his grappling hook to Gruishka. They're all masked up, wearing goggles and whatnot, so very chic for 2020. Very COVID conscious, yes. Very COVID conscious. Even with the goggles, the new thing that Fauci said, you got to wear the goggles now. Uh, and then I saw something else about like something about ears. I don't, I don't know. They're going to have you cover every like part of you. But Just wear a bag over your head and then seal it at the neck. It's yeah. Like a condom. Body condoms mm -hmm. like in the Naked right. Gun. Absolutely. Leslie Nielsen style. Mm -hmm. But I found the scene where they're they're taking the guy's arm off and then uh vector vector shows up and is like good job here's your you know your credits or whatever he pays him and homeboy hugo takes his mask down mid crime Not mid assault yeah and i thought that was surprising because then then when he looks back he's like oh just real quickly like puts his thing back up and and that just kind of bothered me he was like really kind of dumb because he was going to give him COVID. is that why i bothered you daniel He's giving away his identity, even though, you know, Vector was going to just kill the guy anyway. But I guess they didn't have any way of knowing that. Because they thought yeah, they that did. they were just yeah. jacking parts. The real right. criminals wear masks. The politicians walk out blazingly in public. Oh, yes. Well, I thought it was one interesting way. I mean, for like Roger Goodell type, you know, he was kind of controlling his sport, right? By having, by controlling... This one guy who was like too OP, he was bringing in these weapons that were like not street legal or whatever, or according to the rules of the game, kind of like the equivalent of somebody like wearing brass knuckles underneath their boxing gloves or something. But I, it seems like a pretty harsh punishment. I mean, I don't think Roger Goodell like takes a guy into the back alley and like executes him in the football, you know, like a, oh, I when his, ex his excuse or his reasoning is like no one's above the game or whatever. Yeah, his excuse was no one knows about the game, but why not just make a rule saying that, well, that your victory was illegal or you, you're not a winner anymore because we're going to strip you of your title and blah, blah, blah. Isn't I, mean, I know it's whole, a movie. I know it's a movie. Isn't but. that the whole concept of like uh, NASCAR? Like it's all stock cars and then they've, you know, allowed them to modify up to a certain point. Like they can have a certain amount of weight and a certain amount of horsepower and a certain amount of like. Oh yeah, Tire everything's width. down to the nanometer. Yeah, super heavy regulations. Right, but that's just so that everyone's equipment is as identical as possible. Then you're just dealing with the skill of the driver. And Correct. Because it's a private thing, and that's what they want to do. I'm I'm on board with that. You know, like yeah, let's find out who the best drivers are using the you know exact same equipment or whatever. But yeah, he he could have had that kind of thing in place because I guess this guy was winning too many. Too many races or whatever. Too yeah, too many roads. There's more of an element of control. It, it goes beyond the sport. I mean, I think motorball represents much more than what NASCAR represents to our society. He was he thought of himself as a king, and king has to assert his power. It's it's more than just controlling the game. Oh right, you're going so against think, the king. I think the game is his tool of controlling not only the athletes that compete in it, but also the people that observe it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a steam valve for all kinds of yeah. people that are upset about whatever. It's like, well, at least there is a path. There is a path to Zalem. There is one. The chances he, of it are microscopic, but there right. is a path, just like the way of getting your your way in a in a vote. You know, at least and, there's a way to use some vote in what you want, right? He controls it. He's like the power-hungry governor that now thinks he should be as important as whatever nationally you know voted in politician is he he's power hungry he's got pride and he controls something that that he views as a central part of society yeah and he is absolutely powerful in that situation 
in that in that area. All right. All right. Well, I think we've hit uh, a bunch of last notes here, so we should probably start to wind down. And Robert, I don't need your permission to live. I remember that was a quote in this, and I thought that was also timely uh, for um, today's environment, where we could tell that to the governors or the state enforcing the state enforcers telling them we don't need their permission to live life. And not just as a vegetable, not just for the sake of breathing in and out and eating, consuming, but actually living life and enjoying life. Tom Woods has been really great about that in his uh, email newsletters talking about, well, what is life? Is it just a biological function and that's what we should be satisfied with? Or should we be living our life and enjoying experiences again? Uh, because what's a life worth living if not beyond the biological. I think there's a lot to that. We can't just all be vegetables in pods, you know, matrix and style. might be onto something there. I don't know. All right. Well, what, sounds good. Sounds good. Well, why don't you lead us off in the final summary review there, Robert? Okay. Uh, Alita Battle Angel. If you haven't seen it, yeah, why not go see it, man? It's uh, like you said, like our guest said, Alex, it's simple. It's not a super complex, heady kind of a movie. It's a fairly straightforward action sci-fi film. Um, it's got a main central character that they got, got right. I think the eyes, the enlarged eyes, make the character more emotive. And I, I enjoyed it. I appreciated it. Um, I thought the actress who played that role did a great job. I don't know how much was enhanced by the cgi i don't know but it's it's essentially seamless from as far as i can tell maybe in 20 years it'll look terrible but right now it looks great um so you get the main characters right and uh it's it's not going to look out of place in terms of the appearance of the film uh the performances are, i think for the most part are pretty bog standard except for alita i think she was fantastic um but other than her you're kind of got cartoony cut out kind of villains that are kind of evil for evil sake. I mean, it is kind of analogous to politicians and Kings and how power corrupts and you can, it's very believable. Um, but I kind of wish it was a little more banal evil and less like cartoony kind of evil. Like, you know, that would be a little bit more of a commentary for, for my sensibilities, but it's still, it still illustrates, um, you know, a corrupt system that is absolutely immoral. We're not giving enough information to really get into the nuts and bolts of exactly how and exactly why, but we know there's something wrong there. Um, overall, I think it's a, it's a good popcorn film. I don't think it's going to blow your mind. I don't think you're necessarily going to be having like really super, a lot of in-depth discussions, even though we just devoted a couple of hours to it, but um yeah, you'll have a good time, and uh, yeah, I, I, I give it a six point five. I, I it's it's not quite a seven, but it's it's not as bad as a six. So it's it's strong, it's positive, but it's it's not it's not necessarily a movie I'll come back to again and again. I enjoyed it, but I wouldn't say it's like a classic. Or anything. But all right, well, well done. But, well, but if they make oh. a sequel, I would watch the sequel say that okay yeah I, i'm gonna agree with your sentiments in a lot of ways uh and and also give it a very similar score it's not quite a seven it's probably six six and a half something like that uh it's entertaining it's like a good popcorn flick and it's one of those movies that not knowing who made it i'm gonna view it differently than knowing who made it and i think actually knowing that it's robert rodriguez and james cameron and that all this technology that went into making it actually makes me appreciate it more because when I watched it without having that foreknowledge, the first time I watched it, I was like, eh, this feels like a teen kind of movie. Like, I'm not like that impressed by it. It's it's almost almost like a, an animated movie with some live action. Uh, and I didn't really like the storyline all that much. It seemed to be a little bit convoluted for what was going on. And I did not buy the love story at all. I, did, I hated Hugo's acting. I didn't really care for Jennifer Connelly's acting because she seemed like she was Cruella DeVille, DeVille like you were saying, Robert. Uh, this like caricature of a cartoon villain. But 
after knowing, after watching it and then watching it again and then knowing who made it and kind of sort of appreciating more of the nuances, I think I liked it a little bit better. And then finding more reasons to like look into it and have discussion points, a lot of the notes we were talking about that maybe um, have, you know, just a greater appreciation, but it's still, you know, six and a half to, to just under a seven. Uh, it's, it's, I only watch it because it's on HBO Max and uh, I have that. So if, if I had to buy it, I, I probably wouldn't have bought it because it's available on a service that uh, I had available to me. And because Alex, our guest, had recommended it over a year ago, I might add, um, I finally did get around to watching it. And I'm glad that I did. And so I, I would still recommend it. Uh, so overall, it's 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 a good popcorn flick. And if you've listened to us and then watch it, I think you'll have a different perspective uh, than just going into it cold. Um, so Alex, uh, what's your uh, rating and review? Sure. Um, the way I look at it, I think it's uh, it's an entertaining film. It's it's easy to watch and digest. There's not a lot that's going to tax you mentally, unless you're on the spectrum, like uh, I think the three of us are, and you overthink things. Um, <laughs> there's some things you can you can talk about for sure. Um, as far as comic book movies go, I think it represents something I'm not quite familiar with in the manga uh, platform. What little I've looked into, I think it kind of falls in line with that genre. Um, don't know a whole lot, like I said, about uh, everything involved with that genre, but I really enjoyed it. I thought, like you guys said, Alita's character was great. Some of the other acting was very caricature, but I think that that all kind of meshes together to to make a, an entertaining package. Uh, if I had to rate it myself, I'd probably put it closer to the seven than you guys, um, probably 6.97, something like that. Uh, I really like some of the topics that are covered and like you said, Daniel, I think there's more relatable to it today than there was a year ago. Uh, so anybody out there listening, if you're got something to do on a Friday night or don't have something to do, it's worth a watch, worth two hours. Right. Yeah, and worth- I also, I also didn't buy the love story. I didn't think that the Hugo character was anybody to get hot and bothered over. But I don't think you have to buy the love story to enjoy the film. I think the Alita character is strong enough as a central character to as long as you like her and you're on board with her story, you'll enjoy this. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. And and the Ito character, I think, was good in a fatherly connection with her, and she calls him father near the end. So I think that was sort of believable as far as that goes. And uh, to your point, Alex, I think, yes, this was, this was worth the wait, and it was worth waiting the year so we'd have the present-day events to kind of liken to this because I think that uh, we have – probably a different episode than we would have had back in the time, back at the time when you suggested. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's going to be our show for tonight. So Alex, thanks again for being our guest. I hope you can stick around for some of the bonus content we do after this, which is available for our Patreon supporters at lastnighters.com slash Patreon. I've been putting a lot of uh, random stuff in there, deals and offers and and bonus content and other things. And uh, we're probably going to be able to do a, uh, uh, watch a movie together where we can like chat and share emojis and whatnot uh, in the Patreon group. So we'll probably be doing that like once a once a month, something like that. Um, but uh, next week, Robert, we're going to be going back into the jungle with our uh, connoisseur of movies, film critic guy, John Reed, who's been on for And the Band Played On, Reds, The Aviator, and most recently for Apocalypse Now. And that was a really great episode, uh, I might add. He's going to join us for Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket next week. Ooh, classic war film. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so that should be uh, a lot of fun. And uh, uh, Alex, um, thanks again for for being our guest. Uh, People can check out your prior appearance on uh, this show with uh, Les Mis at uh, lastnarrative.com slash 58. And you can find this show at lastnighters.com slash 136. And also find it on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. And uh, Robert, why don't you tell them what they win if they uh, find ways to support us? Well, you win all our hugs and adulation and c- Cyberdyne hug. What, what, some kind of robotic thing that goes through the internet. I don't really understand it, but it's it's complicated. And it's Erm Oh, there it is. Erm Erm hugs. You get all the Erm hugs. If you, uh, yeah, get us to us on the Patreon, 
or if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, positive, negative, I don't care. Just, just interact, and uh, you can get us on the um, YouTube or the Facebook. There's all those those internet platformy things where you turn on your computer and then you click a few buttons, and then there we are. And then you can type things, and then you get all our our adulations. So yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, and was that we haven't been kicked off, you, Dan? Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you for uh, sharing your your knowledge. And Alex, thank you again for being our guest, and thank you our audience for being our audience. We uh, appreciate appreciations all around. Big three cheers for everyone here. And uh, find the show notes and more at lastnight.com slash 136. And we'll see you guys next week for Full Metal Jacket. And with that, we'll say good night from last night, everyone. Peace out. <laughs>